for Peace IMAP monthly webinar. I'm Peggy Ujiri, the coordinator for IMAP in the Rocky Mountains. IMAP is an association of the Universal Peace Federation, and it represents a global network of journalists who support a socially responsible and moral media. Journalism matters, and it plays a vital role in a democratic society. UPF, an NGO which has general consultative status with the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations, was founded by Dr. Sun Myung Moon and Dr. Hak Jahan, who have dedicated their lives to fostering global harmony and understanding and tirelessly advocating for peace and reconciliation. Today, we're going to be discussing some often underestimated threats to the family. This webinar explores how tra sex trafficking has been hiding in plain sight within our families and communities. And we're going to highlight some strategies to combat this hidden threat. Uh, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, Pierre Beauregard. Pierre holds a BS in Business Administration and an MA in Religious Education. He retired in 2020 after a career of 20 years as a certified financial planner. In 2016, Pierre turned his focus to issues of marriage and family. He trained as a sexual integrity mentor with Michael Leahy of Bravehearts, and he now volunteers as a sexual integrity facilitator with High Noon International. Since 2017, Pierre has been advocating for legislation in Canada to protect children from accessing pornography online. Pierre serves as the Canadian coordinator for IMAP. Please join me in welcoming Pierre Beauregard. Well, hello everyone from all over the world. I think I see some names from Europe uh, and uh, all over the Amer America. We're going to talk about a subject that is not an easy subject, uh, and uh, but we have hope because there are people working at trying to fix issues, and that's what we're going to hear from today. In order to first uh, frame the subject, uh, I, I have a little, just something I want to share with you. So uh, on uh, the 31st of uh, January 2024, maybe many of you are aware that there was a full committee hearing at the Senate Judiciary Committee where there was testimony from the CEOs of the major uh, the major uh, social media companies. I'm sure you recognize, even though he's, you're looking at his bag, that this is Mark Zuckerberg, and he's facing some families of people who have been victimized. And uh, it was quite an intense grilling for them. And uh, I have a quote underneath here which I like, it says, the internet is the greatest unregulated social experiment of our times. So this is from Dr. Mary Eichen, uh, who is a world leading expert in cyber psychology. I've become aware of this because of my work with High Noon as a social integrity mentor, because men who otherwise had almost no issues with pornography uh, became all of a sudden, they had a, something change, it was major. But it was much more impactful with our youth. And uh, now I want to go here to uh, then uh, two one and a half minute clip from Senator Lindsey Graham, who tells famously told Mark, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, "You have blood on your hands." So let's put context here with listening to this. Good Thursday morning. We're talking about South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham. Now, last night's social media hearing centered around children being exploited online. The CEOs of Meta, X, TikTok, Discord, and Snap were all in attendance for this committee hearing. Now, that's when Graham brought up a local suicide case involving sextortion. Here's what he had to say. Mr. Zuckerberg, you and the companies before us, I know you don't mean it to be so, but you have blood on your hands. You have a product. You have a product that's killing people. Now, the case that Graham is talking about there involves the late son of South Carolina Representative Brandon Guffey. He represents York County. Now, Guffey's teenage son was scammed and threatened as part of an extortion scheme. The incident led to Guffey's son dying by suicide at just the age of 17. Now, that crime brings us to just last year, where Guffey started work on what's called Gavin's Law. The bill aimed to crack down on sextortion of teens as well as at-risk adults. 
It's why we're asking for your help this morning. What are some ways to protect your children or even yourself on social media? Maybe we So this is uh, quite an amazing uh, event that happened on the 31st of January. I was watching it live. Maybe mm -hmm. some of you here were. I was, and uh, it was incredible, very powerful. And uh, there are more and more measures coming from uh, lawmakers, uh, states that are trying to block access to, to pornography, to children. Te Texas come to mind, uh, Utah, uh, I don't know, I don't remember them all. Here in Canada, we have a bill on the, that's going through the House of Commons being studied by the security, Public Security uh, Committee. And we're very much hoping, as Michelle Abel, our speaker, and me, we're from Canada, and we're really cheering for this. And I know that Patrick and my Peggy are following this closely as well. So our, today, we, we want to give you hope that there are people working for solutions. And uh, our first speaker is Patrick Erlandson. Patrick was born and grew up in Los Angeles as the second of seven children. He's been married to his wife, Machiko, since 1982. He has two adult daughters. In 2010, while working with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in Los Angeles, USA for UNHCR, Patrick first learned of human trafficking in organs from field agents working in Africa. In 2012, he began leading the Prevention Subcommittee on the, of the Long Beach Trafficking Task Force. He's a very uh, he is a speaker, activist, organized a number of events such as two youth exploitation safety symposiums in the city of Long Beach. He founded FatherCon, which has held many conferences. In 2018, he founded See It, End It Film and Arts, uh, Film and Arts Festival, and in 2020, added a global platform for international online participation. He led a demonstration against human trafficking every month for over four years in Long Beach as Men Standing Against Trafficking, MSAT. He has presented workshops on the link between human trafficking and pornography. His priority is prevention of human trafficking in two areas, vulnerability and entitlement. The family, especially through fathers and men, and culture through music, film, and arts. He is a board member of Artists for Change and works in partnership with the YWCA, which came aboard as a financial uh, nonprofit partner for See It Ended Film and Arts uh, Festival and Father Khan. Father Khan is developing and providing presentations and workshops on the significance of the, fa of the fa of fathers and the prevention of human trafficking, most recently in Vienna, at the 32nd Commission on, the, on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice under the United Nations Office of Drug and Crime. Patrick, the floor is yours. All, all that is a very long-winded way to say that uh, it was. this was just something I couldn't turn my back on once I learned about human trafficking. Um, thank you so much, Pierre, and, and all of you at IMAP for hosting this event, because this is such an important topic, and it's also very timely. Um, as you pointed out very astutely with the clip from the hearings. Um, I am going to jump right in because I am notorious for going overtime. Um, let's see. Is that good? Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Okay. Now all I got to do is make sure that I can change them. Yes, we can see that. Okay, great. Okay. So the first thing is, for me, is like, you know, I started looking and, and working on the prevention of human trafficking, and that kind of led me to see this intersection with, with fathers. And so I started looking at what, what is unique about fathers. What do fathers bring to the family and to the home that, that is significant and unique and different from the mother? And so digging into that, there's, there's a number of different things, but especially the protection and teaching element. Um, where if you don't have a father in the home, they're missing out. Children are missing out on something very stabilizing and something that really shapes how they feel about themselves and the world around them. Um, it's, it's different from what they get from a mother. And we have now in the world today, we have 100,000 single mothers. We have children in the hundreds of thousands 
um, or 100, I'm sorry, 100 million single mothers. And that means that there's hundreds of millions of children growing up without a, the presence of a father. Um, so one of the things that's really misunderstood is the important role of the father. A lot of the influence comes in how they play with children. Um, through the, the kind of play that a father has with kids, you have the teaching of empathy. You have children that are accepting, taking a risk um, and how important that is that they actually know that they that they don't have to be afraid of the world, that they actually can accomplish things on their own, um, that they can actually stand up for themselves. A lot of those come from the way that they play with, with the father. Um, a father tends to put the kid up in the tree and tell him to jump out of it. There are not very many mothers that tend to put a child in danger and then tell them to risk their life and limb. Um, but fathers will. And that's a really important, important part of how children develop. Um, also, moral, spiritual, social, and religious education really comes from the father. Um, you've seen that in tests that were in, in studies that were done in Europe, where whether whether the children followed in the faith of the parents was more determined by the father than even if the mother was was faithful and attended church every Sunday. That there is a unique kind of a guidance that comes from fathers. Also, being a role model for boys. And also, you know, as a as that first male love that that girls can, you know, look forward to in their lives, that comes from the presence of a father. So when I started father con, many people ask, like, you know, why fathers? And what I found in talking to survivors and talking to to former traffickers and talking to um, even buyers, there was always a father element. There was something that connected to to the presence of a father or the lack of a presence of a father. Um, and so I looked at it the, several ways that the fathers intersect with human trafficking through their own personal behavior. So if you're a father and you're spending time watching pornography, you're intersecting with human trafficking. There is no way for you to know if that person that you're watching on the screen, screen is, is a victim of human trafficking or not. A very large number of victims of trafficking are being used also in pornography and um, so if you're if you're looking at pornography, you may be intersecting even passively, not even knowing that you are. The other thing that that you know that the pornography industry, the algorithms of pornography take into consideration is every click. So every time you click on something and watch something, how long you watch it, all of that is being noted and and then that goes into wanting to produce more and more content. So if you click on something and look at something that's fairly violent, or humiliation based, then that that communicates to the porn industry that they need more of that content, and that means that they're not necessarily going to have up to be humiliated and and radically abused. So then that these can be victims of human trafficking. Also, buying sex, where not not every person who looks at pornography and not every man is going to go out and pay for sex, but but an increasing number are. And a lot of that is being driven by, by their intersection with human trafficking through pornography that then creates an appetite and a desire that leads them to the streets to go see and who, the, who they can act out on what they're seeing in pornography. Um, also the impact on their sons and daughters. Clear evidence, there's very clear data now on what happens with, with sons. If sons don't have a, a present father, even if he's living in the home, but if they don't have a present father who's really engaging and being a part of their upbringing, they, there's a lot more anger, there's a lot more acting out, a lot more violent behavior, dropping out of school, very poor uh, attendance at school, um, and a, a kind of sexual abuse of others. It also, it also comes from not having that presence, that stabilizing uh, presence of a father, or the, the kind of the role modeling by the father. Daughters tend to experience more of a diminished sense of their own value. Um, they, they don't experience as much the, the sense that they're worthy to be loved. That's like removed when there isn't a father giving them that love and assuring them that they're beautiful, that, they're, that, they, have, that they have reason to be confident in themselves. Um, so that vulnerability is what human traffickers exploit. Um, also, daughters who are, who are raised without the presence of a father tend to be more engaged in risky sexual behavior, which also leads them into the hands of exploiters. Um, so men are also, this is my concern. I started working in the prevention of human trafficking and you really saw, you know, men are demonized. Men are the evil. Men are the ones who are, you know, like taking advantage of, of, of people, of, of vulnerable and exploited children. Um, 
but also if you look at it from the standpoint as a father and now currently as a grandfather um men are losing out on the richness of their experience as fathers you're you're trading away this incredibly valuable position and role as a father for something cheap and temporary and and so many men are ending their lives just like without anything to be proud of without a sense of of, a, of having accomplished anything of real worth and they're not their their homes are broken their children don't like them there there are so many men who are in this situation in, in the UK today it's the number one cause of of death of of men under the age of 45 is suicide um so we're seeing this decline in men's sense of their own value and worth and a lot of that is because they're being groomed by a sex industry and encouraged to, to act in ways that destroy that are self-harming to themselves as well as harming to the people that are victimized um i think these these points fathers buy the lie that other things will provide them the happiness instead of their families so they get they get pulled away from that center of where their real joy and, and success in life is um they they believe that they're not really necessary I run into so many men who who have feel that they're not really necessary in how their children develop and grow. This is a root problem that's uh, that's allowing the vulnerability to increase that traffickers exploit. This is what really drove it home to me. Um, why why it's so important that we work with fathers and fathers understand their role. Um, Jack Reynolds was convicted of sexually molesting over three hundred children, and he spent twelve years in prison, almost thirteen years. And when he got out, he did an interview. And the thing that he said was, if I, they asked him, like, well, what kind of children would you target? And he said, well, it wasn't so much the children that I would target, but I would make sure that they didn't have a father in their life. If they had a father, then he stayed away from them. Um, also, if they had close friends that they would tell uh, what was happening to them, he would stay away. But he said, if it was a single mother, he would appear as, as her savior. He was gonna be the one that's gonna help her out of all of the problems that she's facing. Um, so children are targeted by traffickers. It's getting very, it's a complex thing. We, we've we've relied in the past on very kind of simplistic um, understanding of, of what human trafficking is, what constitutes commercial sexual exploitation, uh, where there's money exchange for sexual behavior. And a lot of times now we have this increasing number of of boys. Some people are estimating now that half of the people being trafficked are are actually boys um, but it's very underreported because they will not come forward. And a lot of times they don't have a trafficker. So in that case, the person who's trafficking them is actually the person who's giving them money in exchange for sex. Uh, but this all gets very, very complicated now in a legal and kind of an illegal context, like how we approach human trafficking. But the the children that are being exploited, 400,000 in the foster care system, you know, any child who's lonely, afraid, angry or sad and has access to the Internet. Those children are so easily accessed by predators and also by human traffickers. Um, they prey on the vulnerability. And this is why my concern is with fathers. If if we're contributing to our children being vulnerable, then we're contributing to them being uh, targeted by traffickers. Um, homeless and runaway youth. That Now the current data is that one out of every five children who is a runaway or homeless will be sexually exploited at some point. Um, so one of the things that's very hard for a lot of parents to understand, and which really both fathers and mothers really need to understand the, the reality for children growing up today with the Internet, that they, they feel that they're living in two different worlds, that there's the cyber world where you can say and do anything. You can entertain yourself with any kind of any kind of content because it's available 24 seven. And then there's the real world where you're going to school and you're having to talk to your parents and things like that. But in, in a child's mind, these are two very different worlds. And, and this is leading to a lot of problems. This case was recently reported in the Washington Post, a 16 year old boy who became fascinated with violent imagery. So he, he was getting more and more interested in, in seeing violence. He started a discord group. He actually had 58 different different groups on discord and on various other platforms um so he so he would target he would target children between the ages of 18 and 17 he'd get them to send a nude picture of themselves and then he would he would kind of carry on this kind of violent exploitation of them um, a 14 year old girl responded because she she liked horror movies 
she was just hunting for something to do with horror movies. She ended up on his site. Um, he ended up directing her oh, after sending the nude pictures of herself. He then directed her to carve his name and the names of other people in the group into her skin. Um, so she she mutilated her own body. And then he had her behead their the family hamster um, online so they could watch. And then it was he was at the point of telling her that the next day she was going to have to commit suicide so that he and the whole group could watch. Um, but the mother overheard her talking and and saved her from that. Um, and the, but the mother's the mother's comment about Discord was that Discord is providing a safe space for evil people. Um, and I think this is one of the things that came up in that Senate, you know, the the hearing in Washington. Um, again, with that quote, the internet pornography is the greatest unregulated social experiment in human history with 24 seven access to anyone with an internet capable device of any age. This is why I think Pierre and many other people are leading this fight for age verification, um, which is an, an incredibly important step. We've already seen it have an impact um, in Texas and, and Utah, Louisiana, different states where now then Pornhub pulls out and they won't allow their content to be shown there. Nothing is foolproof, nothing solves all the problems, uh, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, one thing that always, uh, you know, that that I've always seen with pornography is actually to be stimulated by porn is actually your brain working properly. And that we we look for stimulation, we look for content that's gonna um, fascinate us and intrigue us about the world that we live in. The problem is porn completely hijacks your brain. It hijacks that God-given natural, beautiful curiosity that we have. Um, and it it changes who you are, it changes your identity, and it changes your your appetite, your sexual appetite, which is extremely frightening when you when you think of all the things that are now possible. Um, this is Heidi Heidi Olson. I'm not going to play the video, but she she explains that in her work as a forensic nurse dealing with rape cases and and sexual abuse cases that the that the largest number of perpetrators now are between 11 and 15 years old, the, the, the cases that she's seeing. And the Canada statistic between 2006 and 2022, you had an increase of 25,000% of children's, of child sexual assaults. And, and the number rose from four to 998 young people charged as committing the sexual assault. And the only connection is that they're watching porn and wanting to act it out on someone, on someone vulnerable. Um, this is, again, that case of, of Brandon Guffey. Um, I spoke to him, the father who lost his son. It was a two-hour window where they had left a device in, the, in, the, their son's home, in his son's bedroom. And in the middle of the night at midnight, you know, he was approached by someone who wanted you know, to mess around. And it looked like a beautiful girl. And so with, within minutes, you know, he started engaging with this person and then gave them enough content where they turned around and then blackmailed him and wanted him to send them money and he couldn't send it. And within two hours, this, this incredible 17 year old young man was dead um, just between meeting someone and then, and then resulting in his death. And, and I think sextortion is one of the, one of the most tragic things that's happening. And also with, with deep fakes now, I mean, it doesn't even have to be a real picture of you. They can they can take images that you even post online, create you doing horrible, horrible things using your image and then blackmailing you when you haven't even done anything. Um, so we, we're reaching a whole different level now of using AI and using um, deep fakes to now um, exploit children. So to me, a lot of this boils down to this this point of entitlement. Uh, the more that we feel entitled and pornography more than any other kind of element in our society, in our world today is constantly giving you this message that you're entitled to something that you don't have. You're entitled to more sex, better sex, sex with whoever. Um, it's pornography is a, there's no mutuality. I don't have to consider the other person's feelings at all. I should be able to get all the gratification that I want. And so we're, we're being fed this in advertising uh, and every quarter politics, um, even in churches, we're getting fed a message that you're entitled to more than you have. And that highlights what you don't have. It makes you feel like you're, you're missing something, that you don't have something. It decreases your sense of gratitude for what you do have. And then it, it makes you feel like you're being victimized, which then justifies um, your, your ability to go out and take what you want. 
So this is this is one of the reasons why we see this increase in men willing to go out and pay for sex is that there's this justification. I should be having this experience and I'm not having it at home. So therefore it's okay for me to go out and, and get it. So, so with FatherCon, we really try to try to address the issue. Not only, it's not a men's organization. So we want to raise and elevate the understanding also with, with women that, um, that it's extremely important that we understand the significant role of the father, that there's support for fathers because of the, the impact that they're going to have on their children. So we address fathers, father figures, those that are in the role of a father, um, and also future fathers. How can children start to prepare? How can boys start to prepare for a, for a future as a father so that they don't drag into their marriages and into their, and into their parenting you know, a lot of the shame and a lot of things that they're going to feel bad about? or even kind of when they've been sexually abused and they bring that into their marriages, um, that we can kind of heal from all of that before you end up with, with children. Um, so the con, people ask me what the con is. The con is the lie um, that we, we, we're lied to about what's really gonna make us happy. It's also developing the ability to converse, to, to talk deeply and, and, and significantly and, and openly with our, not only our spouse, but also with our children and learning how to bring up these things. And then the conference, which is an opportunity to really come together. Um, we've done film screenings. So we have panel discussions as ways to educate the community. Um, and then we have our upcoming conference is going to be on May 24th and 20, 25th. So we have incredible keynote speakers. We have about 20 workshops on all different topics relevant to, to fathers and families and keeping children safe and a lot of resource organizations. So I invite anyone who's interested who would be in California uh, to join us for this event in May. Um, and then just things that you can do. My emphasis is always prioritize becoming a trustworthy person. Um, if you're if you're a spouse, encourage your husband in any way possible to become trustworthy so that he becomes that guiding figure, a positive figure for children, not just your own, but for a community. Um, and then there's all kinds of little things you can do, like don't allow your children to have devices in their bedroom. Um, at night, it's it's one of the one of the more dangerous things that that is being done. Um, with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna close. This is my brand new baby grandson and my family, and I invite you to to contact me anytime. Um, this is a fraction, a tiny little fraction of what really needs to be said on this issue, and I hope that Michelle takes it away and and deepens your understanding in a way that you can act upon. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Well, thank you, Patrick. Uh, I remember you uh, talking to me about entitlement as being uh, the main motivator for, uh, you know, the objectification of women. And of course, I suppose that extends to all the way to predation, which is the egregious, incredibly egregious thing that uh, uh, Lindsey Graham brought up and that you met this uh, per the family. Uh, this is a very, very tragic situation is going on. So now we're going to hear more from Michelle Abel. Uh, Michelle Abel is a survivor. Uh, she personally is a survivor of familial trafficking and abuse and a staunch advocate for the exploited, marginalized, and oppressed. She works in providing direct support to victims and survivors, speaking at conferences and providing training on adverse childhood experiences, trauma, and familial trafficking. She has submitted briefs to different uh, committees in the Canadian House of Commons, United Kingdom uh, House of Commons, and advocated for legislation in the United States Congress and United Nations. Michelle is also the founder of Bridge to Future, a, non a nonprofit whose primary mission is research, advocacy, and policy advice against generational trauma, intimate partner violence, and commercial sexual exploitation of women and children. And Michelle also works with the Salvation Army. Her hope is to completely eradicate all forms of intergenerational trauma. And we're lucky to have her in Canada. I thank God for that. As, as this is a precursor for commercial sexual exploitation of women and children, she prays that her contributions in this territorial work will touch hearts and change cultural mindsets and biases. Michelle, take it away. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, 
Thanks so much. Um, thank you for having me here this afternoon. And I want to thank all the participants in this webinar. So I am a survivor, as Pierre uh, said, of familial trafficking and abuse. I was abused and trafficked by several family members throughout my childhood and teenage years. Um, I have been filmed and photographed. I had several abduction attempts made on my life uh, from childhood to my adult uh, years. I have seen and experienced some of the most heinous acts that can ever be committed against a child. Uh, since a younger age, I have tried to protect the youngsters in my family from the abuse and violence I was suffering. And since then, I have committed most of my life to doing everything possible to protect and safeguard women and children. Um, in 2022, I founded Bridge to Future, which is a nonprofit organization, um, uh, primarily to fight such sexual exploitation of women and children. Uh, through a sort of advocacy and um, research and policy. So children and youths have a natural curiosity. They are capable of exploring, exploring technology at an amazing speed. They quickly learn how to use devices and applications. So we can sometimes wonder if they were born with innate knowledge. We should not stifle their curiosity, but we need to put some safeguards in place. As Patrick uh, and, and so many others have clearly outlined, online safety is a global issue. And it is imperative that we as parents, caregivers, and concerned citizens uh, take an active role in safeguarding and empowering children and youths from online harm. It is the utmost importance that we address the, the subject of child and youth online safety. Recent news of a 12-year-old boy in British Columbia here in Canada underscores the urgency of dealing with the growing threat the Canadian children and youths face online. This death is the third reported one due to sextortion. We do not know how many children and youths are coerced into commercial sex trafficking by being blackmailed through sextortion, but in my educated guess, I would think that one is too many. In Canada, our online sextortion has increased and can have fatal consequences for Canadian children. Apps like Snapchat and Instagram are at the forefront of reported sextortion cases. And according to cyber tips, there is about a 150% increase in sextortion reported in the last six months 815% reported online sexual luring of Canadian children and a 36% increase in online victimization of children. In the New Mexico lawsuit against Meta, Facebook and Instagram parent company, Meta internal documents showed that up to 100 thousand children were sexually harassed on a daily um, daily on their platforms. Pimps have been using dating apps to target potential victims and they use teenagers over willingness to share everything about their lives and to collect information. They look for the vulnerabilities that they can exploit. And this is a dangerous link between sex trafficking and online dating. Provincial human development and sexual health education curriculums fail to address the following. Hypersexualized media and culture, 
sex trafficking recruitment tactics to be aware of, like what I refer to the Romeo pimp? And what are healthy relationships, healthy sexuality, porn distortion of healthy sexuality and online safety, sextortion, online child sexual exploitation, among other important issues. There is an emerging threat on the horizon, like the advancement of artificial intelligence, generated fake nude photos posted online, as has happened in a Winnipeg school last December. Uh, apps that uh, are targeting minors like social sports book, they intend to be introductory experience to the world of sports gambling. Gambling harm prevention experts aren't convinced that they, that by providing an on-ramp to sports betting for users that has virtually no safeguards, Social sports book apps are building a gateway for youth to develop real life gambling problems. Currently, adult content websites use age gating tools as a form of age verification, but this is not the most effective way to ascertain a person's age. ILO, for instance, formerly called MindGeek, a major operator of adult online streaming platforms could have taken but did not take all the necessary measures to ensure that child sexual abuse material, or we refer to it as CSAM, or non-consensual sexual material was not present on their platforms. Since 1998, 2257 regulations were approved by the U.S. Congress as part of the Child Protection and Obscenity Enforcement Act. The 2257 model release form is a legal document in the U.S. used mainly in the adult and entertainment industries. It exists to provide certification that a performer in an explicit shoot is of legal age and consents to being recorded. In January 2024, ILO made a public announcement that would require co-performer IDs and proof of consent for all uploaded content. Since 2015, ILO could have prevented minors from accessing their platforms. ILO launched an age verification provider known as All Pass Trust, formerly called Age ID. This service uses third party providers to authenticate the user's age and a single sign on model that allows the verified identity to be shared across any participating website. They first introduced this in Germany, but chose not to apply it to all their users. So we may ask, what are parents, legal guardians, and caregivers? What can we do? Well, children seem to have a natural knack for new things. That is because their brain look at novelties and they try to figure out what they can do with it. But today's parents and legal guardians need to be very tech savvy. On average, parents only spend a total of 46 minutes in the amount of time talking with their kids about online safety throughout their entire childhood. And this must change. When it comes to reducing the potential online risks, Parents are better positioned since children generally trust them more. A bridge to future, we are in the process of developing a layered defense strategy. So imagine an onion with its multiple layers at its center, and it's your child. Now you need to add as many layers as possible. The first four layers are the online safety mindset, how to have age-appropriate conversations with your children 
about online safety, learning the basic tactics that online predators use, and the grooming process as well. The establishment of a set of rules and boundaries by parents. So let me give you an example of some of the rules and boundaries we suggest to parents. Remember, your role as a parent is to provide and prepare your child to face the world. Example of common safety rules for children and teens. So never give out personal information, including your name, address, phone number, or home address. Do not post your photo on public sites of any kind. Do not send naked photos to anyone. And certainly do not chat with strangers and don't open emails from someone you don't know. Uh, one of the, the most important things I believe is not to respond to hurtful and insulting and bullying messages. And of course, to report inappropriate uh, messages. I would suggest that you at least spend 30 minutes talking with your children about their day, their life, their friends without distraction of devices and listen to them as much as possible. Establish a habit of open communication and trust that they can come to you with any problem. Have age-appropriate conversations with your kids about how hypersexualized media and culture is, healthy relationships, and healthy sexuality, um, online safety, of course. Know all your kids' friends and their families as much as possible. Have an understanding of the use of technology, devices for education and communication, not just for entertainment. So from the fifth to the 18th layer in, in our program, you will find technical knowledge, configurations, technologies, and resources. These layers of defense are module. You can add or remove layers according to your specific situation, and you can keep the lines open for communication so that you can devise a, a safety plan with your children and help educate yourself and them. And I think it's really important to get involved in your community, share this information as much as possible. So I see that we're short on time so that we could get some questions in, but I would like to thank each of you um, and, and I'm open for any questions now. So I'll just end it there. So thank you very much, uh, Michelle. Uh, it's quite a long list of uh, yeah. long list of suggestions you have. Uh, if you have a document with your 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 layers of defense that you can yes. share in the chat, that might be good. Uh, my, I'd like to throw your question right away as we're fresh on your talk. There, uh, we have parents uh, listening in, and probably yeah. more grandparents than parents. <laughs> And okay. uh, they're probably going, oh, my God, what am I going to do, you know, in front of this? You know, I mean, it's so it's pretty daunting. But yeah. what would you say at what age you start to talk to your kids and how to start? Because, you know, I remember hearing you at the Salvation Army the other day. And uh, I, I, I was telling you that uh, I tried when my son was 14 or 15 and it was a bit difficult. I have to yeah. start much earlier. So yes, but definitely we see that we have to start much earlier because we are seeing um, an influx of child on child abuse. Um, so sometimes we refer to that as peer on peer abuse. But uh, what that basically means is that children are showing their friends um, sometimes pornographic material innocently. So they're accessing games or what they think are games, and then they're taking them to these highly explicit platforms. And, um, you know, we're seeing that children are, are being manipulated into uh, watching these 
types of contents, not understanding, kids don't understand. So I definitely say, and I think I shared um, a story with you, um, you know, with within my own family. And, and here's a six-year-old child that is being bullied because she simply doesn't have a phone. Um, but this is where we're seeing that from kindergarten and up, it is starting and it, it's it's a bigger problem than than we would like to really admit. So what do you, what kind of things are happening in uh, primary level? So primary level, we're seeing, uh, you know, some touching, some sharing of uh, material for kids that don't have phones. Um, they're they're being shown by their their fellow schoolmates uh, content that is extremely explicit, and so that tweaks the interests of the children that don't have. And then we we see that this is part, this is grooming, this is conditioning. All of this starts mm -hmm. at this young age, and this is where we're seeing that children. Uh, from a very young age are, are getting hooked on on pornographic content. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's it's extremely important for us to start having these important, you know, conversations, age appropriate conversations mm -hmm. with our young children. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, thank you. Um, Patrick, someone asked, how can well -men, women help to empower fathers? How about that? That's a great question. Um, I think encouraging, encouraging, if you understand how fathers impact children, and this is not just your own children, but, uh, but others as well. So um, father figures are extremely important as well. But in any time we encourage men to be responsible, to, to, to feel that they're necessary, that they're needed, um, so, I mean, just some some little brief things. We do an event around fathers reading to their children. When a father reads to the children, the, the children will retain about 20% more language than if a mother reads. The mother reading is just absolute heaven. It's just you drift off into, into this peaceful place, which is incredibly valuable. When fathers read, it, it, there's much more firing of the brain. So there's, there's more of an interaction with the written word. So... You know, a mother or, a, or a, a woman can encourage a father to read to children. I mean, it's a really simple thing that has actually the data shows that if a father reads to his kids consistently, that those children don't drop out of school. They do better in school. They have a much closer relationship with the written word, um, which helps them through their entire life. So, you know, men so often think I've got to go out and take an Uzi and go kill pimps. You know, it's kind of I got to go do something really traumatic and, and big when actually we can have a huge impact in small ways, you know, show, showing affection in front of children. You know, I mean, so so many of us are not, not good at that. But actually, you know, I've seen it in my own daughters. Like if I hold my wife's hand, they respond so positively. And so so many of us don't, we don't show signs of affection for each other as husband and wife in front of our children. And they're getting bombarded with messages that marriage is an old fogey thing to do and it's not necessary anymore. And having a whole bunch of partners is what life's all about. And we need to demonstrate, you know, we need to demonstrate that actually there is a there is something really gloriously special about an enduring marriage and having a relationship that lasts through ups and downs and and thick and thin. I mean, but I think, you know, the more that you can learn and encourage and encourage men to learn about their significant role that, that they're going to play with children and in the family, it, it everything improves. The the life for the the spouse improves, the children's health and well-being improves. There's there's a great book by Meg Meeker um, about fathers. I think it's the dad hero book. Meg Meeker is a is a pediatrician, but she's done so much work on the roles of fathers and the impact they have on children. Mm -hmm. um, she, has a, she has several books. Um, so you're saying fathers so, have a very, very important role in the family. And con conversely, I heard you say that many men think their families would be better without them and end up even going to, so far as to commit suicide. Uh, you know, can you comment on that? 
So. Yeah, I think, I mean, one really strong example that stood out for me was meeting Rodney King's daughter, um, Laura King, and we've become friends. And, you know, all we know of it, Rodney King, if you remember the case in Los Angeles, was pr police brutality, drug abuse, and riots. Those are the only things that we usually equate with Rodney King. But he was an amazing father. He he never missed a single event that his daughter had in school. And not mm -hmm. only her, but her friends who didn't have fathers, he was there for them. He would buy them notebooks. Um, he was a great dad, but he was fighting his demons. I mean, he had horrible problems with drugs. And and yet, so it'd be so easy for, for that father to say, you know, my kids are better off without me. I'm checking out. Um, and then you end up with, you know, a whole nother layer of problem for the children. Um, we have we have cases of fathers committing suicide where they feel like, you know, they were sexually abused. They never healed from it. And they leave their children in the lurch. And so many of those children, you know, on a very subconscious level, they feel like, man, I wasn't worth my father staying around. So I must mm -hmm. not be worth very much. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're communicating to children. Yeah, Michelle. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it's, it's so important because even when you were doing your presentation, and I know that we could share lots of information, but but being a child uh, without a dad and then migrating to, you know, a big country with a single mom and the impacts of that, of not having uh, a, a dad in, in my life growing up, what that meant for me. And uh, then while I was being abused, and so this is how sick and depraved uh, some of these uh, predators are, I call them, but, um, you know, they wanted to take the role of my father. And so even uh, in the abuse, they, they would talk about, oh, well, you can call me dad or you can mm -hmm. I'll be like your dad and I'm here for you but you're abusing the child and you know so there's so much and I know uh, that, that there's just so much information that we can share and have that conversation of how important it is to have fathers in our lives and positive male role models so thank yeah. you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Also, the, the further on that is like, even if there's a divorce, I mean, I think you've got to put aside your personal feelings and and, and continue to support the father in the lives of children. It, it's yeah. so often, you know, the, you know, maybe this dude was not a good husband, um, but he's really necessary in the lives of your children. So to, and yeah. to be encouraging, I've seen so much where, where couples get on the same page where they prioritize the children over their own yeah. personal feelings and it, and it works miracles on those kids. They're so much safer and so much better off. Um, so Absolutely. if you have siblings, encourage encourage them to to prioritize the children because we're we're leaving them out to dry. Yeah. Okay. So one more question, and then we'll go to closing comments. Um, and you can both take a stab at this one if you want. Uh, some people think porn is entertainment, and we say we have they have to have freedom. Those entertainers of self expression. How can we make people understand that the connection that porn is essentially porn is exploitation? You go if ahead. It, unless you disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think, I mean, there is just reams and reams of data on on what happens to our brains, and I think that we our 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 brains will rewire especially if we're younger. But even for adults, I mean, adults are really struggling with this. Um, interacting with internet porn is very different from the Playboy magazines of the past, you know, or cave drawings of a woman with large breasts. I mean, we're talking about very interactive, an interactive experience, um, which completely, you have absolutely no necessity. In fact, you're discouraged from having any kind of empathy or feeling for this other human being, which, which is really stunting our ability to actually interact with other human beings as if each each person is irreplaceable and, and a valuable member of the human family with hopes and dreams to be realized that no one else can realize. I mean, we're, we're diminishing the value of, of individuals through our interaction with porn. I think the scariest thing is, is that it actually changes your appetite. So you have men who, like, they'll be exposed to something, like, you know, three, three, three men and a transgender person, you know, they'll, they'll see something and they'll reject it. And, in, and within a year, they'll be hunting for it. 
So our appetite will be changed by an industry that uses algorithms to force us into, you know, more and more intense content, which means more violence, more humiliation, you know, more degrading of another human being and finding enjoyment in that, finding that as entertainment when someone's actually, you know, being misused um, is horrifying. I mean, you know, it's like, yeah. And, and I think the, the, this is also one reason why we have men who end up getting arrested for having child pornography that were never interested. They were they were never you know, interested in children, but the, the algorithms of pornography will guide you and, and keep exposing you to material and your your dopamine hits will be will decrease by seeing the same content. So you need to some, see something more extreme, extreme to get the same hit. Exactly. So you're yeah. being led into more extreme content. And this is where you end up all of a sudden here you are with pictures of 10 year olds and you were, you know, this is my thing is we have all these men who, when they look at themselves in the mirror, they can't recognize themselves anymore. You know, you have become yeah. a stranger to yourself by an industry that's pushing you in that direction. So porn. But, I don't know. but here's the thing, you know, it's, it's a drug because you're constantly chasing the new high. And that's also what we're seeing in children the escalation of mm -hmm. what content they're they're actually viewing. But I just want to say one thing. How can filmed rape, violence, and torture ever be considered entertainment? Mm -hmm. How is that entertainment? Yeah. And, and society just accepts that from a woman who was abused, filmed, and on camera, don't know where her images are. I just want you to understand what that feels like and, and just understand that there's no entertainment in that. And we need to do better in the US, in Canada to protect women and children in our country. And yes, Patrick, we need our men to, we need good men to stand with us and be beside us and speak up for us. Thank you. You know, uh, John Kirkley in the chat just wrote, uh, diabolical is the word. Pornography is diabolical. I agree. Yep. Uh, and you know, and uh, let's cut to the chase. But uh, so uh, final statements hmm. about uh, Patrick. Go ahead. Final statements. Closing statements. Okay, so, so one thing is in having conversations with your children um, is... They're terrified. Like I said, they're living in two different worlds. The cyber world is like a world to them. It's their life. So one of the reasons children don't come and tell you, even if they've experienced something really threatening or something that really makes them feel uncomfortable, less than 10% of children are coming and reporting to their parents when they experience that kind of thing. And a lot of that is the fear that you're going to take away their devices. Um, and so I think it's how you handle those situations where they have to be able to trust you that you're actually yeah. you're not just going to punish them for being exposed to something, but you're you're able to listen and sit down and talk. And, and it means that you have to be able to have a very uncomfortable conversation about how things make them feel. Why did you feel this way? Guiding them through that conversation is so much more effective than coming in and saying, don't watch this stuff. This is poison. You're hurting. Why are you hurting yourself? Um, it's like they're following their their natural the function of their brain which is curious yeah. so we need to find yeah. ways of talking to them that lets them know that we actually love them and, and support them and that they can yeah. come and tell us anything because that's creating the greatest danger right now is kids are not talking to their parents and then again we have to become trustworthy it means i have to control myself as well if i'm on my phone all the time and then i yell at my kid for being on the phone that's not going to fly and so ch children really want to, they want the integrity. They want to, they want to, to have people that they can rely on and trust. And so we need to prioritize that. Thanks, Patrick. Michelle, you have the last word. <laughs> well, I just think I, I would like for everyone to do uh, what they can in supporting uh, bills that are out there to protect um, women and children on platforms and uh, I would really like to see more conversations around uh, what we can do collaboratively together, just to work together and make the necessary changes. So, so Michelle, as someone asked in the last comment here, how to talk to kids about this? You want to put well, your 
Are you willing to put your email in the chat and say yes, absolutely. You can share me? it. Yeah, yes, you can share it. So yes, that's Susan Edwards in the chat. Suzanne, she, Michelle will put her email. Don't be shy. Send her an email. This is what her her whole passion is: how to help to talk, talk to kids. She has a heart for her children because she knows that the harms that can come. So Absolutely. thank you so much, Patrick. Thank the you. incredible work you do, and Michelle, we're so grateful thank for you. your presentations today. God bless you all and everyone in the chat and uh, participated. Let's make this world a good world. Shall we do it? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Oh, that's Thank fireworks. You guys. I like that. <laughs> oh, wow. That's lovely. <laughs> okay. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Michelle please and Patrick. Share, uh, please bless. share my email. Thank you. Yes. Uh, please share. Oh, yeah. Michelle, your email. Yeah, I'll share it in, stay on the in line the chat. until I share my your email. Can you put it? Uh, you can type it to Michelle. Where we're going to not. We're gonna not uh, I don't remember it by heart. Thank you, John. Say, say, say something, John. John, the John, the great guy from 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 Kenya. Uh, I've been two and a half years in Kenya. It's like the Garden of Eden. Everything grows here. I've got a wide circle of friends. I've got a uh, a family next door that's adopted me as uh, Kuka, Grandpa. <laughs> Great. Anyone else wants to say something? Don't be shy. It's okay. Lift your hands. I'm waiting for the... <laughs> The Zoom should be ending, but still, since it's continuing, just go yeah. ahead and express you, yourself if you want to. Yeah, I'm really grateful to uh, Michelle and Patrick. Uh, Thank you. Very good description, very clear um, evidence, and hopeful, a hopeful direction. We need to get involved. We need to become serious. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you, Pierre. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. welcome. <laughs> thank you. It was wonderful. A great session. I really appreciate it. Alfredzin Plourde, bonjour. Alfredzin, je suis content de te voir. Happy to see you. We've got a great lady here. She has the heart of gold. Mm -hmm. Alfredzin. Mm -hmm. Everybody in Canada loves her. Uh, Pierre, I've shared the email. Please oh, good. let me know that it's there for everyone. Uh, I don't know. You must have shared it. To, I don't, to, oh yeah, okay, I got it. Is uh, it there? You shared it, is it to all? It yes. says on my end to everyone. Yeah, but okay, I see it, yes. Trying? Okay. Okay, well, bye Very everyone, good. thank you. Thank you, Michelle, go, can, and uh, we'll see you uh, around the corner. Soon. <laughs> Soon. Thank, thank you, everyone. Montreal. Thanks, Yusef, for being here from San Diego. Yusef, who's Yusef? Yusuf's down in San Diego. Yusuf Miller. He's he works a lot with Father Khan. He's incredible. Oh, wonderful. Person. So anyone else here is from Las Vegas? Lift your hand. Say say show yourself or something because you gotta help Patrick. Yes, please. I don't know where's EJ, but uh